Greetings, welcome to Electronic Circuits 1, lecture number 8. I am Bezal Rosavi. Today we will continue to look at circuits that use diodes in them uh, and uh, try to hone our skills in analyzing such circuits. Uh, we saw before that we could use the different models for diodes uh, for, for different uh, amounts of approximation in analyzing the circuits. And today we want to continue this exercise and become more and more comfortable with uh, diode circuits. Now, uh, if you recall last time, this is uh, what we uh, talked about. We said that a, a diode can have a one of three models. The actual exponential model, uh, this black curve here, uh, which is uh, relatively accurate but uh, cumbersome in analysis, or the constant voltage model, which is less accurate but uh, is easier to analyze. And finally, a very coarse model, namely the ideal diode model, uh, which turns on only if the voltage wants to become positive rather than if the voltage wants to pass a certain amount VD on. So we saw that in uh, most cases we prefer to use uh, this intermediate model, the constant voltage model, because it's a good trade-off between accuracy and uh, simplicity of the analysis. Now we also looked at uh, one example application of <coughs> uh, uh, diodes and we saw that if we have uh, the line voltage at 110 volts or 220 volts and we want to produce a DC level of some amount, uh, 5 volts, 10 volts, 20 volts for let's say a laptop computer then uh, we have some operations to perform to get there. And we saw that we use a transformer to lower this swing from a large value, a large dangerous value, to something moderate, maybe 10, 20 volts. Then we use a diode to rectify this waveform, meaning that, for example, let only the positive half cycles go through and block the negative half cycles. And then we apply this filter so that we could extract only the DC level, the average value, and remove all the other frequency contents. All right, uh, we also mentioned that the analysis of diode circuits, uh, when we start out, we don't really know which diodes are on, which diodes are off. Sometimes it's easier, easy to see, but sometimes it's not. So, the way we approach the problem is we assume a certain state for each diode. For example, we just assume all of the diodes are off when some voltage is minus infinity. Now, we immediately write these assumptions on paper to make sure that we don't forget. So we say D1 is off, D2 is off, etc. And then we proceed with the analysis. We know that when the diodes are off, they have no current, so they are an open circuit. Whether we use the ideal model or the constant voltage model. So we proceed with the analysis and calculate everything. Then at the end, we have to see if the results that we obtained are agreeable with the assumptions that we made at the beginning. If yes, then good, the assumptions are correct. If not, then the assumptions are incorrect. For example, if we assume a diode is off, but at the end, we find a current flowing through a diode, obviously that was a mistake. So we have to go back and revisit that assumption. We have to assume that the diode is not off under that condition and proceed with the calculations. All right, so today, to extend these ideas, we will uh, look at some principles of diode circuit analysis. I will give you a few pointers that are always good to keep in mind when we analyze these circuits. And then uh, we'll go over some examples that employ these principles to analyze interesting combinations of diodes and other components. Now before we start that, I thought we look at a simple application of diodes. I have given you little examples here and there, and here's another example of what a diode can do. So here's the example. So, all right, let's suppose that we have 
a Bluetooth device that runs from 1.6 volts. So here's a Bluetooth device. that would require 1.6 volts of supply for proper operation. All right, now it just turns out that we do not have a 1.6 volt battery. We have a three volt battery. So here's a three volt battery. And the question is, how do we connect this battery to this Bluetooth device so that uh, the Bluetooth device is happy. Well, I cannot connect it directly because it will probably damage the Bluetooth device. The voltage is too high. What can I do? Well, maybe I can use a resistive divider <coughs> to attenuate this three volts to 1.6 volts. But there's a better approach, and that approach incorporates diodes. Well, what does 1.6 volts remind us of? Uh, well, it's 2 times 0.8 volts, and we know that diodes typically have a forward bias voltage of about 0.8 volts. So perhaps if I take two diodes and put them in series and forward bias both of them, I can obtain a voltage of 1.6 volts. So this is what I will do. I'll take two diodes, like so. And I would like to create about 1.6 volts from here to here. Of course, by, by making sure that they are forward biased, they have a current flowing this way. And then, once that happens, I connect them to the Bluetooth device. The only question is, how do I bias these diodes? How do I make sure that they actually are on and are in forward bias? Well, again, I cannot connect these directly to here. Because if I have just a wire here and a wire here, then I have three volts here, three volts here, three volts here, I damage the device. So I have to have some uh, component between these two points to sustain the remaining three volts minus 1.6 volts, 1.4 volts. So for that, I will add a resistor here. Okay, so resistor R1. All right, so now let's see what happens. Well, <clears throat> if you like, you can actually simplify the problem by first not connecting the Bluetooth device <clears throat> and see what's going on here. Well, we have a positive voltage, a resistor, two diodes. The diodes are forward biased. With typical currents that we have, each diode has about 700 to 800 millivolts. So this total voltage is about 1.6 volts. All right. Okay, so that's good. Now. Uh, why do we have two diodes instead of a resistor? Uh, why is this better than using one resistor here and one resistor here? Well, that goes back to the property of diodes that we mentioned. We said that the current through a diode is an exponential function of the voltage. The current is an exponential function of the voltage. It's a very strong function. Conversely, the voltage across a diode is a logarithmic function of the current, as you can see here. So the voltage across the diode is a weak function of the current through the diode. In fact, if you remember, we said that if the current changes by a factor of 10, the voltage changes by only 60 millivolts. So let's write that here, and then we'll see why that's relevant to this application. So the <coughs> voltage across each diode is a weak function of its current. Of course, we are talking only in the forward bias region. All right, so what this means is that even though this current might fluctuate, and I will show you why, 
this voltage doesn't fluctuate much. And that is in contrast to what we know about resistive dividers. If we have a resistive divider instead, R1, R2, connected to a Bluetooth device, then the voltage generated by this resistive, resistive divider and delivered to the Bluetooth device is not as stable, as constant, as the voltage that these two diodes generate. Why is that? Well, uh, because the current and voltage relationship in a resistor satisfy ohm, satisfies Ohm's law. So it's a simple linear relationship. Whereas the current and the voltage on a diode has a log dependence, so it's a much weaker function than the linear function that we would have here. As an example, let's suppose that this Bluetooth device, uh, one Bluetooth device draws a certain amount of current. So let's say it draws one milliamp. But then we change the Bluetooth device to something else, and that device draws, for example, two milliamps. So two milliamps. Now, if the current goes from 1 milliamp to 2 milliamps, then uh, if the current through this diode, these two diodes, changes from 1 milliamp to 2 milliamps, or, or if it changes by 1 milliamp, the voltage drop here can change by a very small amount. Whereas for a resistor, if the current goes from 1 milliamp to 2 milliamps, this voltage drop or this voltage drop can change a lot. So that's an important property, important difference between using diodes versus resistors because the voltage across the diode is only a weak function of the current. Now we could make this work, make this insensitive to the current fluctuations of the Bluetooth device if we choose a very large current flowing through R1 and R2. So, so much so large that the current fluctuations here are negligible compared to the current that we have here. However, that would mean that we will drain out this battery very quickly. We don't have to do that here because uh, the voltage here is relatively stable even though this current is not very large. In fact, when we start out with this current through R1, that current might be only twice the current fluctuation that we have here and this voltage is relatively stable. So uh, sometimes this is called a regulator. So we say the diodes operate as a simple voltage regulator. just to make sure that this voltage doesn't fluctuate much despite variations. The variations could be in the current that the Bluetooth device uh, pulls from this system, or it could be that this voltage also fluctuates. Why? Well, if you have a battery that is fresh, that is new or completely charged, <coughs> and you measure its voltage, it could be three volts. But as time goes by and we drain charge out of it, as it loses energy, the voltage actually drops. So if this voltage drops, this voltage doesn't drop much, again because of the weak dependence that we have. Whereas this voltage exactly drops because we have a simple resistive divider. So that's an interesting property of the diodes. So when you consider a charger uh, for your cell phone or your laptop, inside that charger and also inside the cell phone, there are very complex regulator uh, circuits that make sure the voltage delivered to the inside of the phone or inside of the laptop is very stable despite these various fluctuations that might happen. And uh, that is necessary, otherwise uh, the circuits will be damaged or will not function well, all sorts of things. All right, so this is a simple application of diodes, this uh, regulating behavior. It can create a nice little constant voltage that we can use for various purposes. All right. 
We now move on to uh, analysis of diode circuits. Again, we want to extend our understanding and, and our skills. And for that, we need to organize in our mind the principles that help us analyze these circuits. As you have seen, these diode circuits are generally nonlinear. They are not like resistors and capacitors, etc., that we have seen in basic circuit theory. So because of this nonlinear behavior, they take extra effort and extra thinking uh, so that we can analyze them correctly. All right, so we will talk about principles of diode circuit analysis. And this time I'm assuming that we will use the constant voltage model, this model here. Uh, that's a little more realistic than the ideal model, so we will use that in our analyses. All right, so when we want to start analyzing a general diode circuit, and we don't know which diodes are on, which diodes are off, and we are uh, sweeping, we are varying some voltage or some current somewhere, trying to see how other quantities, other currents and voltages in the circuit vary, uh, then uh, we do need to have to be methodical uh, about uh, solving the problem. So, uh, the first principle that we will keep in mind, and I mentioned that before, is begin by assuming certain states for all diodes. Meaning diode number D, diode D1 is on, for example, diode D2 is off, etc. Now we can make this completely arbitrary. We can say, I just assume all of them are off. That's fine, nothing wrong with that. But if you want to reduce the mathematical labor that follows, you can look at the circuit for a little while and try to make an intelligent guess about which diodes might be off, which diodes might be on. It's just a guess, it's fine. You can proceed with that guess. If it's wrong, it's okay. At the end, we will discover that it is wrong. But it's, uh, it's better generally to look at the circuit first before we make an assumption about the states. So notice that uh, in these analyses, I usually say the diodes are on or off. I don't say they are forward biased or reverse biased. And the reason for that is that when we have uh, a constant voltage model, uh, well, do we call this forward bias or reverse bias? Uh, it's a little tricky, right? Um, you might say this is reverse bias because we have no current. You might say it's forward bias because the voltage is positive. So to avoid that ambiguity, we say the diode is off here, or the diode is on here. That's unique and clear. Okay, so we assume a certain state for each diode. And we immediately write these states on paper to make sure that we don't forget later. Uh, then we say check the final results against these assumptions. So when we get to the end, we have various currents and voltages. We do need to find them anyway. And then we come back and say, all right, I assume diode D1 is off. Is the current through D1 zero or not? If it's zero, good. If not, we have a problem. Uh, I assume D1, D2 was on. So it must have a current. Is there a current through D2 or not? And not only that, there's one more thing we have to be careful about. So that takes me to principle number two. All right, so again, let's focus on the constant voltage model of the diode. We say if a diode is about 
to turn on or off is about to turn on or off, meaning it is right here. It could be off, it could be on, right at this corner. So if a diode is about to turn on or off, it must sustain a voltage of V D on, right? The, the voltage has to be this much. The voltage cannot be this much or this much, right? It has to be V D on. So the voltage across the diode has to be V D on, of course, with proper polarity, meaning that the anode has to be more positive than the uh, cathode by this amount, 0.7 volts, 0.8 volts. All right, so I would like to draw this diode here so that you remember Whenever we say VD, VD means from here to here. Okay, so it must sustain this much voltage, but its current is small. You agree? If you look at uh, this point here, we see that, yes, even if a diode is turning on, its current is very small. So that's the property that we have to keep in mind. If the diode is about to turn on or about to turn off, it is right here, then it has a voltage on it. It has a four bias voltage on it of 700 to 800 millivolts, but the current through it is very small because of this approximation that we are making. You will see that this principle is critical when we analyze diode circuits. We have to remember the, how this works. All right? And finally, one more principle that we need to keep in mind. Okay, so now if we decide that a diode is on indeed, uh, we have to make sure that, uh, let me uh, just check here. All right, so. If our analysis at some point indicates that the diode is on, so if a diode is on, then it must have a current. But if that current, but that current has to have a particular direction. If a diode is on and uh, carries a current, the current must flow from the anode to the cathode. So this means that if we, are, as we find out in our analysis that this diode is on, meaning it has a current, if, we decide, if we, our calculation shows that there is a current through this diode, then that current must flow this way, right? It cannot flow the other way. That would be incorrect. So when we consider these three principles, then we can always detect if we have made a mistake somewhere. Without these, the world can be very confusing. Okay, so now with these principles, we can go ahead and try to solve some interesting problems. Uh, let's start with a simple example, and then uh, we make things more interesting. So let me change the color of my pen to blue. All right, so here's a little circuit that I have uh, cooked up here. We have a resistor R1, we have a diode, and then uh, we have a battery. I just bought this battery, I just call it anything I want, VB. And uh, this is the circuit of interest to me. 
and I would like to apply a voltage to the input of the circuit, vary that voltage from minus infinity to plus infinity, and then try to look at different quantities. You could have a current through the devices, you could have voltages, there are all sorts of interesting quantities to look at. So let's apply a voltage here, Vx, and the first quantity I would like to find is Ix. As Vx goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. All right, and I would like to use the constant voltage model for D1. D1 is this diode here. Okay, well, no problem. As usual, we begin with Vx at minus infinity. So I will draw this axis here. Ix versus Vx, and I'm assuming I'm way out here. So this point is very negative with respect to this point. And we would like to examine the circuit. So uh, my intuition says that under that condition, this diode is off because I'm trying to create a negative voltage here. Again, we don't have to go with our intuition. We can just blindly say something about the diode write it down so that we don't forget, and then proceed with the analysis. But if, we, if it's simple enough, we can just as make a reasonable assumption. All right, so D1 is off. Uh, that means that the circuit reduces to this. We have R1. We have an open circuit for D1. Then we have a, di we have a battery. This battery is not related to the diode. This battery is something we added ourselves from outside. It's just uh, for to make things interesting. It has nothing to do with the diode. So this is VB. And now we vary Vx from minus infinity and bring it higher. Okay, so how much is Ix? Well, uh, there's an open circuit here. There's no current through R1, so Ix is zero. All right, so Ix continues as zero for a while. Okay. All right, so as Vx increases, something should happen, hopefully, otherwise the circuit is not really interesting. And then uh, what could happen? Well, we're thinking that if this voltage, this voltage becomes positive enough, this diode turns on. And the question is, how much is positive enough. Well, does this voltage need to be only VD on 0.7, 0.8 volts with respect to this point? No, because we have another battery here. So, let's say this battery, as an example, is one volt from here to here. So this point is one volt higher than this point. If this is one volt higher, then the anode of D1 needs to reach VD on above one volt for D1 to turn on. Because we know that when D1 is at the edge of turning on or off, it needs a voltage of VD on across it, as our first principle, second principle said. So we have to raise this voltage so much that this voltage reaches approximately 0.7 plus VB, 0.8 plus VB, or more precisely, VD on plus VB. So raise Vx so much that, let's call this node something, node N, so, so much that Vn reaches uh, Vd on plus Vb. D1 begins to turn on. Okay, so far so good. Now, uh, so we understand that 
as Vx increases, at some point Vn reaches Vd on plus Vb, so let's say 0.7 volts and 1 volt, or 0.8 volts and 1 volt, or something along those lines, and then D1 turns on. Now, the interesting question here is, if this voltage is this much, how much is this voltage? So think about that for a second. All right, so we are raising Vx from negative values, and we're moving forward, moving forward, increasing, and we have reached a value for Vx that gives us a Vn equal to Vd on plus Vb. Now, the key to finding the value of Vx for this amount is to remember that if D1 is at the edge of turning on, if it's at the edge of turning on, right here, its current is very small. That was also this principle. We said, if a diode is about to turn on or off, it must sustain a voltage of Vd on, but its current is small. So because we are right here. So even though D1 begins to turn on, even though D1 needs a voltage of Vd on across it, its current is still very small because we are right here. So since the current through D1 is still small, that means that the voltage drop across R1 is also small. Voltage drop across R1 is small. How small? Well, we can make it arbitrarily small. I can say, I am sitting one microamp above zero, so this current is only one microamp. If this resistor is one kilo ohm, this voltage is one millivolt, so it's small enough, right? Okay, so now does, does, does this tell us how much Vx is? Well, we know that this voltage is Vd on plus Vb. We know that this voltage is very small, close to zero. And we know that this voltage is equal to this voltage plus this voltage, KVL, right? This is equal to this plus this. So if this is close to zero, Vx is close to Vd on plus Vb. So the value of Vx that places D1 at the edge of turning on, meaning right here, is given by Vx is equal to Vd on plus Vb. So to avoid confusion, we'll call this, for example, Vx1, so that we remember this is only one value of Vx. And it is the value that places a diode at the edge of turning on. All right, so how much is that? Well, some amount, maybe if Vb is plus one volt, and this is 0.8, 1.8 volts or something. So we just continue until we reach Vx1. And when Vx1 is that much, the diode has turned on. Okay, that's very good. All right, now what happens next? Well, from here on, the diode is on, so we have to redraw the circuit with the equivalent uh, of the diode. We know that when the diode is on, it can be replaced by a short circuit in series with the battery. So right around here, the circuit reduces to this. We have R1, we have our diode. So again, I draw a switch that is turned on and a battery for the diode, which is VD on. And then I have the old battery, VB, and then I have VX. And I'm trying to measure IX. Okay, so we know that past VX1, the diode is on, so we can replace it by its equivalent circuit. All right, can we find VX in this case easily? Yes, uh, we know that the voltage from here to here 
from now on is exactly constant. Why? Well, because we have a short circuit, no voltage there, we have a battery, VD on, and we have another battery, VB. So the voltage at node N, in fact, will not change from here on. VN will be constant. And it's equal to VD on plus VB. So I can say that the current through this resistor is equal to this voltage minus this voltage divided by the resistor. So this is the uh, procedure that we will use quite often in this course. Uh, previously, I haven't done it this way exactly. Previously, I would say Vx is equal to Ix times R1 plus Vd on plus Vb. And then I would take Ix out. But equivalently and more simply, I can say this current is equal to this voltage minus this voltage divided by this resistor. And when I say this voltage, I mean this voltage with respect to here. And when I say this voltage, I mean this voltage with respect to the same point. So this voltage minus this voltage divided by the resistor is this current. So we say Vx, so we say Ix is equal to Vx, the voltage on the left, minus Vd on plus Vb, the voltage on the right, divided by the resistor. So that's also a good, uh, important rule to remember. If we have a resistor somewhere sitting, and we want to apply Ohm's law to it, we say the voltage on the left minus the voltage on the right, divided by the resistor, is equal to the current that flows from left to right. Now, when we say voltage on the left, that voltage is measured with respect to some common point, maybe ground, and when we say the voltage on the right, that is also measured with respect to the same common point, maybe ground. And that's the equation for the current. Okay, so this says Ix is a function of Vx with a slope of 1 over R1, but it's also shifted because of this term. So we just have this, and this slope is 1 over R1. The shift, of course, not surprisingly, is equal to Vx1, as we calculated before. Okay, so we saw that using the constant voltage model for the diode allows us to perform these calculations pretty quickly. Uh, if we had an exponential, it would be more laborious mathematically, not impossible, but just uh, more complicated. All right, so we have uh, this uh, result in the next step. Let's try to calculate, uh, let's see, what did I calculate here? All right, let's calculate uh, this voltage uh, as a function of uh, v, uh, let's calculate Vn, so here's our quiz. Plot Vn as a function of Vx. Vn is the voltage that we measure from here to here, as Vx goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So I will give you 90 seconds to take these results and quickly find Vn.
All right. So what does your result look like? Well, given that we found Ix for Vx below Vx1 and above Vx1, we should be able to find Vn pretty quickly. So let's uh, look at that and see. Let me change the color of my pen and we'll proceed. Okay, well, if Vx is less than Vx1, Ix is zero. The diode is off. The circuit reduces to this configuration here. And this is what we call node N. So what can we say about Vn in this situation? Well, you can see that uh, there's an open circuit here, so there's no current flowing this way, which means there's no current through R1. If there is no current through R1, the voltage across R1 is zero. If the voltage across R1 is zero, this voltage must be equal to this voltage. So we say for Vx less than Vx1, we have Ix equals zero. That means the voltage across the resistor is zero. That means Vn is equal to Vx. So again, as I mentioned in previous lectures, this is a concept that students often have difficulty with. Uh, the notion that this voltage has to be equal to this voltage when this current is zero. It's just simple KVL, right? We know that uh, Vn plus Ix R R1 is equal to Vx, right? I repeat, Vn plus Ix R1 is equal to Vx. If Ix is zero, Ix R1 is gone, so Vn is equal to Vx. All right, so so long as the diode is off, the voltage at node N tracks Vx. As Vx goes up, Vn also goes up with it with a slope of one. So for that, we can uh, uh, plot something like this. Uh, let's see. So that is the plot of, actually let me draw a new plot because I don't want these two plots to get confusing. So let's erase this and uh, uh, draw a new plot. So here's our plot of Vn versus Vx. And remember that Vx1 is somewhere around here. So. We know that below Vx1, we have Vn equals Vx. So we start with the slope of 1. When Vx is 0, Vn is 0. So we do go through the origin. And this continues up to here. And the slope is 1. So it's very simple, right? As long as the diode is off, uh, this Vx goes to the output. Vn go the input goes to the output, if you consider this node as an output node. So now what happens after the diode turns on, once Vx goes past Vx1? Well, the circuit reduces to this. And if you remember, we said that Vn is fixed from now on. It's pinned. It's equal to one diode drop plus Vb. Sometimes we call this a diode drop, Vd on, so about 700 to 800 millivolts. So we have one diode drop plus Vb, and that is fixed. So past this point, we have one diode drop, and that is a fixed amount. And this diode drop, as you know, uh, one diode drop plus Vb, so that is equal to Vd on plus Vb. That is the voltage that we measure right here. Okay, that's this voltage here. All right, so if we take a step back and look at what the circuit is doing, we see that as the voltage at the input goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, if the current is of interest to us, the, uh, we have no current, and then we have a simple linearly varying current as a function of Vx. If the voltage is of interest to us, it lets the input go to the output up to this value, and from this on, it clamps it or it clips it it keeps it at a certain value. It doesn't let the output increase any further. 
So if the input voltage is less than Vx1, it allows the output to follow the input, to track the input. But once we go past that, it keeps it constant. So that is the operation of the circuit. All right, let's uh, look at another example, which is a, just a variant of the circuit. So remember how the circuit looks like. We have a resistor between the input and the output, if you want to call it an output. And then a diode going down to a battery and then going to ground, if you want to call this ground. Doesn't matter, anything. So all, I need, uh, all I'm going to do in the next example is switch D1 with R1. That's it. I will just move these two uh, in, in, in their places. Uh, you could uh, try other things. You could, for example, move this battery, swap the battery with the resistor. Or you could swap the battery with the diode. There are also some interesting variants of the same circuit, even though it's so simple. So let's go ahead and build another circuit with the diode and the resistor swapped. So for that, we go to the next page and see what we get. So this is the next example. I have a diode D1, then I have a resistor, and then I have a battery. And I apply a variable voltage here, Vx. And in the first step, I would like to find the current Ix. We call this R1, and we call this battery Vb. All right, and again, we are using the constant voltage model for the diode. All right, that looks pretty simple. In fact, many of the results that we found in the previous problem should be applicable here as well. So we should be able to go through this pretty quickly. But we are making baby steps. We want to learn how to walk before we run. We want to get comfortable with very simple circuits before we make them more complex. And that's why we gradually play with these configurations, move one device from here to there, and analyze them again. And this is something you can do on, on your own as well. You can swap this guy with that guy, or that guy with that guy, all sorts of things, and analyze each of them. Don't be afraid of analyzing a circuit. Don't be afraid of making the wrong assumptions. The circuit will not bite you. So you're free to make any assumption you want and proceed, so long as you can carefully interpret the final results and see if they agree with your assumptions. Otherwise, be brave and analyze them. All right, so as usual, I will draw my axes here. And uh, I am interested in Ix as a function of Vx. Okay, so again, I'm thinking that if Vx is very negative, this point is negative with respect to this point, this diode is probably off. So I will keep that in mind and I will proceed and see what happens. So somewhere around here, if Vx is negative enough, I'm thinking that the diode is off. So this is what we have. We have an open circuit for the diode. We have a resistor. We have a battery. And we are applying Vx. R1 here, and then VB, and this is Ix. Well, v Ix is zero, it's an open circuit, no current flows, so Ix is zero, no problem there. At what point does the diode turn on? So that's the tricky part, and that's why we need that second principle. The second principle says, for the, if the diode is about to turn on, it requires a voltage of VD on across it. And of course, VD on is from this side to this side, positive here, negative here. It needs that much voltage. But the current through it is very small. So the value of Vx that causes V1 to turn on is found as follows. We say we have a voltage here, Vb. 
then we have some voltage here, and then we need VD on across this. So we call that VX1 again, and we see that VX1, the voltage necessary to turn on the D, D1 is given by VD on, because we know for the diode to turn on by a small amount, it needs a voltage of VD on, plus this voltage. How much is that voltage? Well, for now, let's just say IX goes this way, goes this way. So the voltage from here to here is IX times R1. So let's just write that here for now. And then finally, we have this voltage, VB. Okay? But we know from the second principle that two things are happening with a diode. Number one, it's voltage is approximately equal to VD on because it's about to turn on. And number two, the current through the diode is very small. So if the current through the diode is very small, this is very small. So we see that VX1 is still equal to VD on plus VB, just like the previous example. So we come here, identify VX1, and mark it here. Okay, so very similar to the previous example, pretty easy. All right, so now what happens? As we go past VX1, we are thinking that the diode will turn on. Okay, now when the diode turns on, this equivalent circuit changes. So over here, our circuit looks like this. We have VX, the diode is now replaced by a short circuit and a battery. So here's our little short circuit. And then we have a battery, VD on. And then we have resistor R1. And then we have the other battery, VB. And then this goes back here. Let me erase this extra line that we got here. So that is the equivalent circuit after VX1, when the diode has turned on. Okay, what are we looking for? We're looking for the current that flows through the, this branch, through this uh, loop. <clears throat> Can we find that current? Sure. What we do know is that IX flows through the short circuit, through the diode, through the battery of the diode, through R1, and through VB, and then comes back. So the voltage across R1 is given by IX times R1. Now I can write a KVL. I can say this voltage is equal to this voltage plus this voltage plus this voltage. So we can say VX is equal to VD on plus R I IX R1 plus VB. Right? It's a simple KVL. Okay, so we should be able to find IX from here. And that tells us that IX is equal to VX minus VD on plus VB divided by R1 which is the same as what we found in the previous example. So uh, it's just a linear change with a slope of 1 over R1 starting from Vx1. It's offset, it's shifted because of this term here. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, the current of this circuit happens to be the same, happens to have the same behavior as the current of the previous example. Why is that? Well, if we have a series combination of two terminal devices, and we change, we swap these two terminal devices while they are still in series, we cannot tell the difference in the current that flows through them. So let me elaborate. If you have some two terminal devices in series, whatever they are, 
They can be linear, nonlinear, battery, resistors, etc. Okay, and these are in, in a box. So let's call this one, two, three. And for example, we're trying to measure this current as a function of this voltage. If we go ahead and swap the, these around while they are still in series, the, what we see from outside doesn't change. So that is exactly the same as if we had, for example, two here, and then one here, and then three here. It would be the same thing. In other words, if I put these in a black box, in this form, in this form, and I give them to you, there is no way that you can tell the difference between this box and that box, uh, because that's the property of series two terminal devices. And that's why this circuit and the previous circuit have the identical behaviors in terms of Ix as a function of Vx, because all we did was swap R1 and D1, and all these three are in series. Okay, so far so good. Now, <clears throat> in the next step, let's try to find Vn again, this voltage, as a function of Vx. Why? Well, because we are trying to improve our skills. It doesn't mean that Vn is a very good voltage, it's a very exciting voltage, it's something that solves the world hunger problems, but it helps us understand the circuit, it helps us hone our skills in analyzing circuits. All right, so let's try to find uh, Vn now. Okay, so Vn versus Vx. Is Vn versus Vx here the same as in the previous example? No. The only thing that I said was, if we are looking at these two terminals outside this box, then we cannot tell the difference between these two boxes. But if you're going inside and looking at something here, or something here, or something here, then that is not true anymore. These two boxes will not be equivalent anymore. So, the behavior of Vn versus Vx in this example is not necessarily the same as that of the previous example. All right, well, let's uh, go ahead. We have these types of uh, configurations that we found out as a function of Vx, so they should help us in analyzing what Vn looks like as a function of Vx. All right, so let's suppose that Vx is less than Vx1, so we are here, we know that the diode is off, so there's an open circuit here. And what I'm interested in, let's change the color of the pen to uh, magenta, we'll call this Vn. So I'm interested in Vn, when the diode is off. So from here to here, from minus infinity to Vx1. All right, how much is Vn? Well, we don't have any current here. We don't have any current through R1. If there's no current through R1, the voltage across R1 is zero. That means there's no voltage difference between here and here. Okay? How much is the voltage from here to here? That is VB. So, the voltage Vn with respect to here is equal to this plus this. This voltage is zero because of the current being zero, so Vn is equal to Vb. So again, this is a problem that many students find difficult. When there's no current through a resistor, the voltage across the resistor is zero. It's just Ohm's law, but for some reason, it's not quite intuitive. So this resistor has no voltage on it because it has no current, which means this voltage has to be equal to this voltage. All right, so we can say that Vn, Vn is equal to Vx. So, uh, sorry, VB. So VB is a battery voltage constant, so VN is constant. So, so long as the diode is off, this voltage doesn't change. All right, so why don't we try to draw that here? So VX, IX, and what we have observed is that if VX is less than VX1, then VN is fixed. Vn is a certain amount. 
So that is VB. I'm sorry, this should be, let me clean this up here. I am plotting uh, VN as a function of VX. Okay, so if the diode is off, VN just happens to be constant and equal to VB. Now, what happens when the diode turns on? Well, we go back to this circuit and identify node N and see what happens there. Node N is right here. So we need to find VN as a function of VX when there is a short circuit, a, do a, a battery, a resistor, and a battery. So that's uh, basic circuit theory. Should be pretty easy to find that, right? How do we do that? Well, we say, uh, uh, let's write a KVL maybe to see what happens. Uh, uh, what we do know is an equation for IX. Uh, we know the equation for IX here, right? This is the equation for IX in this region of operation. So instead of repeating all of that analysis, maybe I can say that Vn is equal to this voltage plus this voltage. And this voltage is no longer zero because there's an Ix flowing through R1. And I know how much Ix is. So Ix, this Ix, times R1 is this voltage. This voltage plus this voltage is equal to Vn. All right. OK. But there's a simpler way. It just happens. In this case, there's a simpler way. That's not true all the time, but in this case, it just happens to be like that. So it's good to take a step back, look at the circuit for a minute before we jump in and start writing equations. Uh, well, what I see is that there's a voltage source here. There's a short circuit here. And there's a voltage source here. So I can write the KVL as follows. I can say Vx, uh, let me write a KVL very carefully uh, in the standard form. We start from here, minus Vx, minus Vx, plus Vd on, plus Vd on. From here to here is how much? Vn, plus Vn is equal to zero. So I don't even know what's going on here. All I know is this voltage and this voltage and this voltage form a loop. So I can write a KVL. And all I need to say is uh, minus Vx plus Vd on plus Vn is equal to zero. So what does this say? This says that Vn is equal to Vx minus VD on. That is a very interesting result. It says that the voltage we measure at node N is simply the input voltage, but shifted down by a constant amount, VD on, say 700 millivolts, 800 millivolts, something along those lines. So this says that whatever voltage you have here, we just shifted it down by going through this battery. If the battery were connected the other way, it would be shifting up. This way is shifting down. So we have shifted the voltage down by this battery, and that's what we get. So from here on, we have something like this with a slope of 1. As we can see that Vn as a function of Vx had a slope of 1. But it is minus Vd on because of the shift that we have here. Uh, all right. So that's what we get for Vn as a function of Vx in this uh, expression. OK, so we see that uh, uh, there are uh, many ways to connect these devices. And every one of them poses an interesting new problem. Just like math, right? When you're, you're learning math in high school or in college, there's always a way of building, uh, designing a new problem that's interesting and exercises our brain. So here is the same uh, concept. All right, so this uh, concludes our lecture today. Uh, in the next lecture, we will continue to analyze other types of interesting circuits and, again, uh, try to become confident in analyzing circuits that include uh, more complex uh, configurations. I will see you next time.